Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Sam Fenler, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host On Regulatory Whiplash. We're joined today by Adam White and Will Trackman. Unfortunately, Professor Sally Katzen is under the weather and will not be able to join us today. We're certainly going to miss her perspective, and we hope that she feels better very soon. Our moderator today is Allison Soman. Allison is a legal fellow with, with the Pacific Legal Foundation's Center for the Separation of Powers. Before joining PLF, Allison was a longtime special assistant and counsel to Gail Harriet and the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Allison is also an executive committee member of the Federalist Society's Civil Rights Practice Group, and we, of course, thank her for the great work that she does there. If you'd like to learn more about today's speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers and not the Federalist Society. Without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to our moderator, Allison. Thank you very much for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Sam. Uh, the topic of today's panel is on regulatory whiplash. The regulatory environment in the United States is often complex. State and federal laws sometimes contradict one another. The transition of the American presidency from one political party to another can lead to rapid and dramatic changes in the regulatory landscape. Even transfers of power between administrations of the same party or shifting priorities of one administration can cause significant changes in regulation. This phenomenon of swift changes in regulatory policy is sometimes referred to as regulatory whiplash. We are honored to have two wonderful panelists today. As Sam alluded to a moment ago, both have many accomplishments and publications and full bios can be found on the Federalist Society's website to give just a taste of their accomplishments so that we can save the bulk of our time for the substance of the discussion, I'll go ahead and introduce them both with a nod to some of their major accomplishments. Adam White is the executive director of the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at George Mason Scalia Law School. He is also a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on American constitutionalism, the Supreme Court, and the administrative state. Will Trackman is general counsel for the Mountain States Legal Foundation. Before coming to his current role, Will was appointed to serve in the Department of Education as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office for Civil Rights. Will is a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, Colorado State Advisory Committee, an adjunct professor at the University of Denver, Sturm College of Law, and president of the Federal Society's Colorado Lab Lawyers Chapter. Uh, as Sam, I believe, briefly mentioned, we were supposed to have a third panelist with us today, Sally Katzen of GW Law. We will miss her and her expertise, but I understand that Adam White is familiar with some of her work and can go into a little bit of what she would have said had she been able to join us today. And hopefully we can get a back and forth uh, between the, pa the existing panelists based on Adam's representation of her comments. With that, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Well, thanks for that, Allison. It's good to see everyone. And I uh, am looking forward to today's discussion, and especially the Q&A. So I served, as Allison mentioned, as Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Civil Rights in the Trump administration and saw firsthand how quickly things can change depending on who sits in the Oval Office. And as backdrop, let's just talk through about what, you know, what we're talking about. So Congress passes laws. Many of those laws delegate an extraordinary amount of authority to executive branch agencies. In my case, it was the Department of Education, but it's also uh, innumerable alphabet soup agencies in Washington, D.C. that have a tremendous amount of discretion. And all of those agencies change personnel when the president changes. So the heads of the secretary, of the secretaries all change, the political appointments change. Now, the bureaucrats, the civil service folks don't change, but the direction of the agencies can change quickly. So I'm going to offer a few examples where I saw the greatest amount of whiplash in my role 
And then uh, at least one example in my current role as a um, general counsel of Mountain States Legal Foundation, and then offer a few thoughts about how to mitigate some of the concerns about regulatory whiplash. Obviously, the biggest concern is going to be stakeholders and having to comply with the regulatory regime coming out of Washington, D.C., and in many cases, the anti-liberty effect that may have, because if you think that the regulations are good for you now, but you're on borrowed time until the next administration brings the hammer down on you, you might start to change your behavior ahead of time and suffer whatever restrictions you might anticipate in the future. So the first example I want to offer is Title IX. You don't really need to have any background in Title IX to understand this example, but Title IX is the federal statute that bars sex discrimination in education by recipients of federal funds. And in the late 90s, the Supreme Court announced a decision that sexual harassment was covered by Title IX. And so the Clinton administration issued a long guidance document that didn't go through notice and comment rulemaking. Congress didn't enact a statute. The Clinton administration, just in its, in its waning days, issued a long guidance document. That guidance document survived through the Bush administration. And then uh, in 2011, the Obama administration revisited what schools had been doing for over 10 years when it came to investigating and responding to instances of sexual harassment. But again, no notice and comment regulation, just more guidance documents. And one theme here is that the less an agency has to do in order to issue new rules or new interpretations of statutes, the more susceptible the change is to whiplash. So the Obama administration changes in 2011. They enact further changes in 2014, which um, address how quickly uh, investigations have to occur, what sorts of limitations on due process there are for individuals who are accused of sexual harassment, and then what obligations a school has to respond to uh, you know, even basic allegations of sexual harassment. Now, the Trump administration arrives in 2017, withdraws the 2011 and the 2014 letters, but doesn't withdraw the 2001 guidance document that had come from the Clinton administration. And while I was there, issued new guidance. Uh, and then that guidance was pending until finally a notice of uh, notice and comment regulation could occur, which finally was announced in May of 2020, uh, involving additional due process measures that had to take place and what schools had to do. So this entire time, schools had to pay close attention to what was coming out of the Department of Education, both in terms of regulatory guidance and then also notice and comment regulations to figure out what bundle of duties they had any time there was an instance of, acute, of, of alleged sexual harassment. Now, the Biden administration has announced two separate rules that amend what the Trump administration did uh, between 2017 and 2021. Mind you, Congress has not enacted any statute here. So schools who are paying close attention to Title IX because they know that there's an investigation or a loss of federal funds at stake if they don't comply have to think, okay, well, what's, what's the next thing we have to do? We have to keep understanding and digesting these regulations. There's also the effect of anticipation, which I just alluded to a second ago. If you think that you're going to have to set up a system eventually anyway, why not start now? Why build a system that's going to be antiquated uh, if you are only going to have to change? So the effect can be that schools end up pre-complying with onerous regulations that may have an anti-liberty effect in the long run. The second example I witnessed firsthand is in the race context. So the Department of Education also enforces Title VI um, through the Office for Civil Rights. And in the context of affirmative action specifically, the Bush administration issued guidance that was somewhat uh, milquetoast, saying diversity can be a good thing. You should consider uh, race-neutral alternatives ahead of time, uh, but there is no bar on considering race when it comes to diverse college admissions. The Obama administration swiftly withdrew that guidance when it arrived uh, and instead issued aggressive guidance documents, again, no notice and comment, um, encouraging schools to take race into account more and more, uh, noting that it was not illegal under Title VI. And then when the Fisher cases uh, dropped in uh, 2013 and 2016, used the opportunity to again encourage schools to embark on aggressive uh, race-conscious admissions policies. Now arrives the Trump administration in 2017, 
those guidance documents eventually get withdrawn in 2020. And uh, rather than saying that diversity is to be encouraged or discouraged, the Trump administration says, just look at Title VI and it'll tell you what, and, and court cases, and it'll tell you what you can and cannot do. Not necessarily on affirmative action, but in, in the race context, the Trump administration issued a webinar uh, guidance document saying that segregation in uh, classrooms is uh, a violation of Title VI, that you can't grade students differently based on race, that you can't offer students different amounts of time on assignments based on race, and that diversity and equity programs that uh, engaged in differential treatment based on race, for instance, by telling white students that they were privileged inherently based on their race or violations of Title VI. Within days of arriving, uh, uh, the Biden administration withdrew that document uh, that had said segregation is a violation of Title VI and announced that it was inconsistent with Executive Order 13895, which is the one that says that we need to advance and promote equity. So now if you are a school wondering, is segregation a violation of Title VI? So, you would have the Trump administration saying, no, it's a violation of the law. And the Biden administration saying that even announcing that is contrary to its project of advancing equity. So what would you do if you were a school and you had uh, these sorts of programs? Would you think that they were illegal or actually perhaps consistent with a mission of advancing equity? Uh, my former colleagues and I filed a brief in the uh, SFFA cases saying that while, they, while the court is evaluating race-based admissions preferences, the court ought to go big and address some of these ancillary issues. Because no matter what you say about college admissions and diversity, there are going to be innumerable examples of other ways that schools can use race. And the more ambiguity you leave, the more you let the Department of Education announce uh, what is in between the law and the court decisions and the gaps. So those are two examples. Another is environmental law, which obviously departs from my former role in the Department of Education. But at Mountain States, we have a number of cases that um, involve either property rights or maybe oil and gas drilling or a declaration of monuments by the president. And some of those cases have been going on. I think there's one case that was brought by an environmental group in the uh, waning days of the Bush, the Bush administration, where the, the, the defendant is still some acting secretary who has long since left uh, left power. And because these administrations flip back and forth on their positions when it comes to land use, you actually have a question about what the status quo is. If you have one regulation that repeals the last regulation, but that regulation is struck down, does the previous regulation come back to life? Or suppose you have an, an, an agency that says, we'd like to pause this whole thing because we're drafting our own new rule, uh, but it'll take us two years. So there you have cases where um, judges are staying, uh, APA cases, for many years while they figure out whether the case is going to be moot or not, because the new administration may have a new rule entirely. So there's just a few examples of how, based on who's in the Oval Office, you might see a vast differential in policy. What are some solutions? You know, it's hard to think of anything that would really fix this problem, because by the very nature of our government, whoever is in the executive branch has a great deal of power. Uh, but one solution, at least to minimize or mitigate some of the damage, is that courts in issuing their decisions ought to go bigger, as we urged in our amicus brief uh, before the court on the SFFA cases. The more that courts can resolve, uh, the less likely it is that executive branch agencies can engage in this sort of rapid policy uh, whiplash. Uh, when you are filing comments with executive branch agencies about proposed rules, you ought to or you should, ought to consider urging them to reach some sort of stable equilibrium, uh, which is what we've done in a few, in Mountain, the Mountain States has done in a few instances where we've um, been invited to comment or submitted comments on a proposed regulation saying, look, whatever, whatever rule you adopt, it ought to be something that isn't going to immediately get overturned the next time uh, different persons in the executive branch. And also Congress uh, ought to do a better job of fulfilling its natural role of um, writing statutes instead of delegating an enormous amount of power to these executive branch agencies. Uh, and my hope uh, with the pending Loper Bright case on Chevron deference uh, will mean that agencies have to track statutory language more closely, especially where uh, 
a statute is silent and doesn't affirmatively give an agency authority. So it's possible that we may see some backtracking on this problem if a robust and broad decision comes out in Loper Bright, which would um, reverse or at least modify the Chevron doctrine. So that's where I'm standing. I'm very interested to hear um, Adam's viewpoints and then, of course, the questions and answers, which I can see are already coming in. Thanks. I'll turn it back over to you, Allison. You're on mute. Thank you, Will. Um, Adam, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Allison. Uh, thanks to the Federal Society and, and thanks to, to Will, uh, who made a lot of great comments, made my job a lot easier here. Uh, Sally Katzen would have made my job a lot more difficult, and I'm sorry <laughs> she's not here, but I'll, uh, I'll, I've, I've been on a few panels with her and I'll try to do justice to her, her criticisms. Um, I, I, can't, I can't recall who coined the phrase, the past is a foreign country, but administrative law feels a lot like that right now, um, especially in conservative circles where we're debating uh, the future of Chevron deference and other doctrines, which uh, 30, 40 years ago were developed uh, by conservative judges and conservative scholars who recognized that, that there was a real problem when day-to-day -day administration of the federal government was micromanaged by federal trial judges, federal circuit judges, and sometimes even the Supreme Court. Uh, Chevron deference, uh, its great virtue, as its advocates saw it, was that it allowed elections to have consequences uh, so that if, you, if the public didn't like a regulatory agenda or the regulatory interpretations of an administration, they could vote in a new administration and that new administration could reinterpret the laws. Uh, the best defense of Chevron deference, I think, was Justice Scalia's famous Duke Law Journal article where he really emphasized this point. that the great virtue of Chevron was that elections could have consequences. The agencies would change their position, uh, and that's a good thing. But you can also have too much of a good thing. And even Scalia himself recognized that. A little sort of uh, parenthetical point in that Duke Law Journal article, he said, maybe at some point if you had too many agency reversals of position, you'd have problems amounting to, to due process problems. But he never, he, then he says, I, I don't really need to explore that any further yet. Uh, I wish you were around to explore it now, because it seems to me that's where we are now. And a lot of the issues we're debating within administrative law uh, and, and uh, around administrative policy. Uh, and so today we have Justice Thomas and Professor Amberger and others eloquently arguing that the courts are falling short of their judicial duty um, uh, to say what the law is neutrally and independently without um, bias towards an agency. Uh, that by their lights, uh, Chevron is, is, is a dereliction of that duty. It's unconstitutional. Uh, and judges need to independently, neutrally interpret the law without deference. So we've come really to the opposite side of where we were three decades ago with Justice Scalia. And there's a lot of virtue in Justice Thomas, uh, and Professor Hamburger, and the others in their arguments against Chevron deference, both as a matter of law, uh, but also just practically speaking. So many of the problems that, that, that Will just described in detail are downstream of the fact that elections have such immense consequences. I don't think it's really an exaggeration to say now that presidential elections take on the, the flavor of regime change. With a new administration coming in, with an army of lawyers and a stack of executive orders and all sorts of guidance documents and so on, uh, to immediately... Uh, tear down what the previous administration did and build up what this administration wants to do, at least until it's torn, torn down by the next one. Uh, this is something that Alexander Hamilton actually alluded to in his uh, in The Federalist, in his discussion of why a president should have a four-year term and the prospects for re-election. He said there's real danger in um, too many changes in, in the presidency because each president will naturally feel an instinct to tear down whatever his predecessor did just because his predecessor did it. And that's even before you layer on um, the, the, the political parties and now the modern polarized um, political parties. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, just rapid wild change from one administration to the next. And Justice Thomas's approach and Professor Hamburger's approach and others that would do away with things like Chevron deference would certainly s solve or at least greatly mitigate that problem of flip-flops. Um, and that has real world consequences. Will alluded to many of them. Uh, you know, my own background before I was co-directing the Gray Center with Jen Mascot and here at AEI too, before I was doing any of that, I was an energy lawyer, an energy infrastructure lawyer. And so a lot of my work had to do with capital intensive industries and the immense amount of planning that goes into deciding whether to commit immense resources to a long-term project. And these reg regulatory whiplashes, and I'd go so far as to say the, the weaponization of regulatory uncertainty 
Uh, it has a huge effect on these capital intensive industries, which by the way, are so many of the industries that we need right now, if we're gonna build up the American economy, especially in strategic industries, uh, we need some long-term regulatory stability to allow companies to make some planning decisions. Of course, we live in a country where laws can change. That's why we have a Congress. Uh, so nothing is ever really written in stone, not even constitutional amendments. But in many respects, the more stability you can have, the better. Uh, and especially for, as I mentioned, capital intensive, long-term planning. Um, also, by the way, I'd say we're seeing a lot of this around mergers and acquisitions and other strategic decisions by companies. So much of that, so so much of their regulatory calculus right now turns not on what, what a statute says at a given moment or uh, what a regulation says at a given moment, but what uh, an agency leader is saying at the moment, or to the point of today's discussion, what future uh, agency leaders might say. Um, if your goal is to deter energy infrastructure development, you don't need new regulations. You just need to ratchet up regulatory uncertainty. And if your goal is to deter mergers and acquisitions or other major strategic moves by companies, you don't need a regulation for that. It's nice, but at least what you need is enough regulatory uncertainty to create a, enough doubt in the mind of the companies that they won't want to go through with uh, placing big bets on a new strategic direction. Uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of neutral on mergers and acquisitions. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not so great. That's what we have markets to decide. Uh, but what I don't like is um, companies having to study American politics and monitor the speeches of regulatory officials uh, the way that political risk ana analysts have to monitor speeches uh, in, you know, in, in third world uh, th third world countries with unsteady government. We're supposed to have a rule of law here for a reason. So the question is, what does the rule of law actually mean and how do we achieve it, at least in the context of administrative law? For all the debates that we're having around Chevron, the end of Chevron, the non-delegation doctrine, and those are all incredibly important. I think it's important to take a step back and watch what the Roberts Court is doing more broadly, because in a number of doctrines uh, and, and in ways that cut across the familiar ideological lines, you see the Roberts Court um, slowing the pace of change in agency lawmaking. Um, the, the major questions doctrine helps to achieve that and, and so on. But um, think about, say, uh, well, actually, on major questions doctrine, in the King v. Burwell case, the Obamacare insurance subsidies case, uh, the court um, with Chief Justice Roberts, with the, the Democratic appointed justices and Justice Kennedy, they're the ones who invoke the major questions doctrine to not give deference to the IRS uh, or HHS's interpretations of the law. Rather, they're going to interpret it de novo. They, of course, then they go on to agree with the agency. But they said, we're not going to give any deference. And the reason why they didn't give any deference is very clear from Chief Justice Roberts's question to the oral argument. He said that this question about the insurance subsidies in the Obamacare framework is so pivotal for that framework that it can't be the kind of thing that can be just left to every new administration to totally reverse course on. It would be, uh, it would be counterproductive, self-defeating, and chaotic. Um, so the Roberts Court in King v. Burwell says we're not going to give Chevron deference here because we need more stability. At least that's what, again, Roberts says at oral arguments. And I think it's it's pretty clearly the premise of that decision. But in cases going well beyond Chevron, you see the court slowing the pace of change. We saw that now in the uh, the in the, the second DACA case, not the first one that the court deadlocked 4-4 on after Justice Scalia passed, but the more recent one, the California Board of Regents case, where the Supreme Court held that the, the Trump administration needed to give a, a, a more uh, thorough, um, fulsome defense of its reasoning under the APA. Same thing with the census case, Department of Commerce versus uh, New York, where the Supreme Court held that the uh, the Trump administration needed to give a more thorough, and in that case, they said more candid uh, defense of its policy. In those doctrines and others, you see the court slowing the pace of change um, around ad administration, sometimes to the benefit of, I guess what we call Republican or conservative policies, sometimes to the benefit of progressive or democratic policies. But the, the key, the thread running through all of it is slowing the pace of change. Now, there isn't sort of a unified narrative in the court about why it's doing this. Uh, I think the reasons why Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh, maybe the reasons they're gravitating towards, the reasons they explain uh, are different from, say, Justice Thomas or Justice Gorsuch's explanations. Um, uh, but there is a running thread through it all. 
And so even while we focus on specific issues like Chevron, I think it's important to get the full suite of the uh, of, of the Roberts courts slowing the pace of change of, of, of administrative policymaking. We might well see the end of Chevron deference in the fall, as Will mentioned, though the Loeber Bright case might bring an end to it. Uh, my guess um, is that what we'll wind up with is something a lot more like Kaiser versus Wilkie, where we thought maybe Seminole Rock and our deference would be done away with. Uh, the court ends up staking out a middle ground that decreases the amount of deference, um, but doesn't eliminate it. That too, by the way, Kaiser versus Wilkie, another case that pretty explicitly is meant to change the pace, to slow the pace of administrative change. I kind of wonder if we'll see something similar um, around Chevron deference. My guess is that the, the synthesis we're going to arrive at is somewhere between Justice Scalia's um, view of Chevron deference in the late 80s and Justice Thomas's view of Chevron deference now. And in a way, I think that synthesis, that middle ground between them, uh, is a middle ground between Federal 78 and Federal 37. Federal 78, of course, on the, the need for judges to be independent, to have fortitude, to say what the law is, um, to interpret the law independently. Uh, that's all crucial to the functioning of our constitutional system. But also crucial is James Madison's insight in Federalist 37 that all laws, uh, no matter how much time and effort and skill is put into drafting them, all laws are going to have some vagueness in them, sometimes a lot and sometimes a little. You need to minimize that amount of vagueness, of course, but you can never totally do away with it. And the question then is, how does the judicial system and the rest of our system grapple with that vagueness? Personally, I think the answer is something close to what Will Bode describes in his Law Review articles on, on Madisonian liquidation, um, which I, I largely agree with. I'd maybe put it a little differently than Professor Bode. But I think that's where the court is probably headed, much like in Kaiser versus Wilkie, um, something that slows the pace of change, but leaves some room for deference for genuinely vague laws. Now, this isn't a panacea, by the way, because while stability in administration is important, Hamilton wrote often of steady administration, which I, I might circle back to, stability is important, but so is energy. Uh, energy is crucial to administration. And one of the challenges is that the steadier you make administration, the more risk you have that you're going to drain the energy out of it. Maybe the justice that senses this the most is Justice Kavanaugh. As a D.C. Circuit judge uh, in a case called American Radio Relay League, an FCC case, he was... Um, parsing some administrative law doctrines, um, the Portland cement rule for all the ad law nerds out there, but to, to think through how much reasoning an agency has to give in defense of his policies. And Kavanaugh made clear he was uncomfortable with, um, with the extent to which doctrines like that lead to slow and judicially micromanaged uh, administration. So we have to keep in mind, that, again, regulatory whiplash, um, the unsteady administration is a, is a bad thing and it needs to be mitigated, but we have to keep in mind that often it's going to come at the cost of energetic execution, and that is a loss as well. Now, the major questions doctrine, most of us think of it in connection with um, non-delegation being kind of an echo of the non-delegation doctrine or, or some would say like a weak version of the non-delegation doctrine. I suppose it's those things. But for me, I tend to think of it just as much in terms of the slowing the pace of administrative change, giving people uh, more uh, reason to rely on status quos uh, in advance of agencies announcing unprecedented and transformative new interpretations and policies. Uh, the major questions doctrine I see as much as a doctrine of reliance interests as I do a doctrine of non-delegation doctrines. Now, my friend Sally Katzen, and I mean that, Sally and I are great friends and and uh, we do enjoy arguing about these things. Uh, she sees things quite differently than I do. We testified together at a House Oversight hearing uh, a few weeks ago. Earlier this year, we were on a panel together at NYU, um, a symposium that the, the Gray Center co-hosted. Um, and Sally is, is one of the most eloquent critics of, of, of the Roberts Court's developments. The things that I, I tend to agree with, she disagrees with. Let me just briefly note three lines of criticism that Sally, I, I, as best as I can recall, levies at the Roberts Court right now. And just to be clear here, I'm not going to do nearly as much justice to Sally's points uh, as Sally would, but I'm, I'm trying my best. The fir first line of argument would be that the major questions doctrine is not textualist, that it is a, it's a non-textualist uh, substantive policy choice that the Roberts Court is injecting into statutory interpretation. Very similar to the line of criticism that Justice Kagan has levied against the major questions doctrine in the West Virginia case and in subsequent cases. And, you know, there is some real bite to that um, that criticism, I think one of the most interesting opinions 
of the Supreme Court term was Justice Amy Coney Barrett's concurrence in, um, oh gosh, the student loan case, uh, where she basically said, some think of the non major questions doctrine as a substantive um, interpretive canon that actually does impose some value judgments on or interject them into how we interpret the laws. Barrett says, that's not how I see it. I see the major questions doctrine as a contextual cue as to what Congress actually intended. Um, but no other justice joined that opinion, and for good reason. I think Justice Barrett's approach, um, her characterization of the major questions doctrine is very much at least in tension with, maybe directly at odds with, the, the characterizations of the major questions doctrine that you've seen from Justices uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, the Chief Justice, and others. And frankly, I'm inclined in, in there in the other justices' direction here. I think it is uh, a substantive um, canon. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, uh, the, the role of the judge in a, in, a, in a constitutional republic is to interpret the laws with an eye to Congress's intent, but also with an eye to the overarching constitutional framework in which those laws are, are, are legislated. And so I think the major questions doctrine is a perfectly reasonable substantive canon uh, to ensure that Congress doesn't delegate away its powers or dramatically unsettle the rule of law. Now, who am I to criticize Justice Barrett's approach on this? She's, you know, the most eloquent scholar of uh, statutory interpretation and uh, stare decisis in her generation, and now she's a Supreme Court justice to boot. But just, I'm just saying instinctually, my I, I incline towards the, the the Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Roberts view of the major questions doctrine. But the point here is that I think Barrett's uh, concurrence confirms that there is some real bite to the argument that the major questions doctrine is currently framed is somehow at odds with conventional textualism. And that's Sally's point. Sally's second point is that the major questions doctrine is indeterminate. You just don't know in any given case whether something is a major question or not. And there's some bite in that argument too. We'll see over time how this plays out, but not every question is a major question, just as every student is not above average, um, except, uh, um, well, no, it's just, so I guess with great inflation, but not in uh, not in Supreme Court litigation. So we're going to find out which questions aren't major, much to the chagrin of, of the of the lawyers bringing those cases. But it's true. There isn't a bright line to divide those cases. Now, my response would be we don't have a bright line in Chevron itself as to whether a law is ambiguous or unambiguous. Justice Kavanaugh, again, makes that point very, very eloquently in a Harvard Law Review article a few years ago, reviewing a book by the late Judge Robert Katzman on statutory interpretation. Chevron itself is pretty indeterminate. Uh, statutory interpretation itself often has a lot of judgment calls. That's why we call them judges, I suppose. But I don't think it's fatal to the major questions doctrine that it has it lacks a bright line. If that were the case, uh, then Chevron itself uh, would have been struck a fatal blow, and most of statutory interpretation would be under real clouds of uncertainty uh, as well. But but Sally's point is a strong one, that the judges are going to have to make the doctrine uh, clearer and more rigorous. Uh, Sally's last point, I suppose, um, that, I, that I, on the top of my head, is that the major questions doctrine is just political, that it cuts in one ideological direction. Uh, and for what it's worth, um, that too, in a sense, there's some bite in it. To the extent that the major questions doctrine prevents judges from um, going a certain direction in Chevron step one or Chevron step two, um, it is going to have sort of a deregulatory effect, um, uh, especially when it's seen as a substantive canon that demands clear statements out of Congress for the enactment of new regulatory policies rather than a repeal. There is a deregulatory or counter-regulatory balance to that, but not in other cases. I mentioned King v. Burwell. That was a case where the, uh, the lack of Chevron deference, the use of major questions doctrine, redounds to the benefit of not just the Obama administration, but all subsequent administrations that want to maintain the Obama um, approach against repeal. Uh, cases like that will cut in favor of Democratic administrations as much as Republican administrations. But Sally's right again that most of these cases recently have cut in one ideological direction rather than the other in terms of their outcomes. And I think that conservatives should be too wary, uh, they should be wary of feeding that, um, that sense of politicization um, by trumpeting this as some kind of major partisan win. I, I've gone on forever, and sorry about that. I'll just say at the end, um, the line that I think about the most of, of all in the Federalists these days is something that Hamilton said in Federalist 68, in the discussion of the Electoral College. He said, um, the true test of any government, uh, the true test of good government is its tendency and aptitude to produce good administration. He liked that line so much, he quotes himself in Federalist 76, 
uh, proving that it's not just professors and judges who can quote themselves. Uh, but Hamilton, he's, of all that he wrote in The Federalist, it's interesting that he says the true test of a good government is its tendency to produce good administration. And as he makes clear in the other papers around that, those papers, and throughout The Federalist as a whole, for him, administration is good, steady administration. You need both of those things in proper measure. And I think one of the reasons why the Roberts Court is circling back to questions of steadiness is because we're feeling the cost. These are timeless costs that Hamilton, as his contemporaries, understood and anticipated. And in many ways, the regulatory whiplashes that we're encountering right now are, are a sign that we're living in a kind of Hamilton's, uh, Hamilton's nightmare. Uh, so the question is, how do we make, how do we decrease that instability without totally draining administration of, of its energy as well? Uh, again, thanks, Will. Thanks, Allison. And thanks to the Federal Society. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Will, did you want to respond to any of the points that Adam made? Just just three quick points. First, my um, my favorite part of the Amy Coney Barrett opinion that Adam mentioned is her analogy to a mom who gives the babysitter the credit card and says, make sure the kids have fun. And the babysitter takes the kids to Disneyland. Uh, and that clearly is a, uh, a major question that yeah. should have been consulted ahead of time. Um, and then two other points, you know, on the framing about whether elections ought to have consequences. Part of my worry is that they aren't having consequences because if I'm a regulated entity and a presidential administration that I like comes into office, I can't take advantage of the reform that occurs during that administration because I have to worry about the next administration, the administration after that. So to the point about major investments, about long-term projects, even if I thought that the election ought to have consequences, I can't count on that uh, in the long term. And the last is that sometimes election, elections shouldn't have a consequence. I brought up the point about the OCR guidance document saying that grading students differently based on race is a violation of Title VI. And that was repealed within days of the Biden administration coming into office. So in, in this, because it was contrary to advancing equity, the executive order. So here, that really isn't a question of whether an election ought to have a con. That's a constitutional question uh, and, a, and a question about Congress's law. So I think that framing works sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah. Uh, that's all. Those are those three quick comments I wanted to make before we uh, proceed to Q&A. Well, actually, Allison, Will's second point is incredibly important. And can I can I agree with him for a minute on that? <laughs> um, Absolutely. And, and I'm so jealous. He says, Will, this is actually I promise it was on my notepad right here. But this is exactly right that the, the amount of regulatory flip-flops we have, I couldn't have put it better, the elections don't have consequences now. For me, this is more, you see it more on the, the again, the, the capital intensive industry side of things. If you're gonna build a pipeline or, 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 or any kind of energy infrastructure, industry is no longer looking at the laws on the books. They have to predict where things will be 10 years from now, say. They have to skate to where the, they think the puck is going. And so any single administration's policies mean a lot less than the industry's guess of where the policy equilibrium is years from now. I think a lot of industries looked just look past the Trump administration, Trump EPA policies, knowing that, that those might be law for a day, but not much longer. Um, and so in a way, you have uh, much less respect for elections and for law. Madison you know, famously wrote in The Federalist that, that we need um, stability in our Constitution uh, so that you'd have people build up veneration for the, for the law, for the Constitution. Hamilton's writings on administration are an echo of that, but with an eye to legislation and administration. He's, he, he made clear that, that he, he thought what would build up people's confidence in government overall would be good, steady, effective, reliable administration. And I think the, the low respect that people have for government now, um, in some ways is an echo of the fact that for all that we argue over policies and presidential elections, again, we treat them like they're life and death and regime change. At the end of the day, all of us know that, that anything a new administration does on so many issues is just temporary. Uh, and, and as soon as the new election passes, people are already arguing over what the next election will bring. Um, there's a total lack of, of respect for the stability in law, which becomes a lack of respect for, for and credibility of, of government overall. That's what Hamilton was getting to with his point about um, the true test of a good government 
is 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 its tendency to produce good administration. And so Will's exactly right that we now have no respect for 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 the, the policies that come out of elections because we're just a couple of years away from the next one. And I think the justices probably sense that as well, especially when you see the justices having to manage a nation full of district judges who are now the most consequential administrative officials in our government. They, as much as any cabinet secretary, a random trial judge, um, can stop a program dead in its tracks, can resurrect the previous administration's program. Um, in some ways, the uh, the most energetic administrators in our country are the uh, the, tr- the district judges who uh, who sit in judgment of these policies and issue nationwide injunctions. Allison, you're on mute. Thank you, unmuted. Um, thank you for that response, Adam. Will, did you want to respond, or would you like me to try to jump in with questions? No, I completely agree with uh, with Adam's comments there. So it seems like much of the difficulty here stems from the fact that the two parties have very different visions uh, across areas, one more energetically regulatory, one much less so. Will and I are both familiar with civil rights and education, have deep backgrounds, and there, uh, well, there's some, there's a tiny bit of overlap. Each party just have has very different visions of what civil rights enforcement should look like. While I say steadiness and stability for the reasons that Adam describes as a virtue, how can one provide that steadiness when appointees just have such wildly different views of how the underlying statutes and constitutional principles should be interpreted? Well, I'll take a stab at that. So I completely agree uh, in the broadest strokes with that asymmetrical um, viewpoint of the world. So when there is an administration in Washington, D.C. that is pro-regulatory, they regulate. When there is an administration that is anti-regulatory, they can generally go back to even, but that doesn't entrench uh, the, um, the playing field. It just means that for those four years or eight years, you're back, you're back to even with the understanding, as Adam has been pointing out, that you, ha- you have to anticipate because your projects are going to last a long time that you're going to have to comply with a different regulatory regime in the future. And that asymmetry really does have an anti-liberty effect in my, in my opinion. In terms of what you can do, I mean, I offered a few ideas. I'm sure that there are others, but with courts being more aggressively ro- robust about what they say. So just an example of Title VI, I wish I wish that the court would have gone further uh, in the SFFA decision and said, and also this would be a problem and also that would be a problem. So as to give agencies less flexibility uh, in terms of what they might say is still technically legal, uh, because that is going to lead to more and more flip-flopping. And then in terms of Congress, you have to put them to the test and say, look, you're you're only um you're the only one that I can really hold accountable uh on a more regular basis. And you have to write statutes in such a way, uh, particularly if Loper Bright means that Chevron is uh modified that that makes sense and that encompass the universe of what the regulations are so as not to leave enormous gaps for agencies to uh enhance their own regulatory powers yeah that, that's all that's all really well put and i just add maybe to expand on will's last point that there's no way out of this in the long run without an energized congress um that that one of the problems that i think um, the major questions doctrine has the has the potential of helping to mitigate is that all of our political energy is channeled into the agencies uh, because that's you know that's where the action is. Why did why did bank robbers rob, rob banks? That's where the money is. Um, all the political energy cha- is channeled into the agencies while Congress is left to more or less sit as ombudsman for the administrative state. And so things like the major questions doctrine, slowing down the pace of change, telling activists, you're not going to get everything you want by just reinterpreting regulations. You got to go back to Congress. Ideally, that would that that will channel political energy back into Congress and Congress may begin to legislate again. Um, They're not going to legislate things always necessarily that I like. um, And the things that I do like will probably be watered down. But until we get 21st settlement, 21st century settlements of the most uh, prominent and often divisive issues of our time, once we get settlements of those through actual legislation, we're going to continue um, fighting these out in administrative agencies, um, which is a real loss. Uh, 
thank you for that. Um, this was actually something that was down my list to ask about. How can Congress be revital, best revitalized so that it starts to take on its proper role and can provide a more vigorous counterweight to the kind of agency overreach and regulatory whiplash that we're seeing? Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I jump into that one first, Will? Um, I'll just say, um, you know, my colleagues here at AEI, uh, they are, there's a number of them doing really great work on the revitalization of, of Congress. Uh, Phil Wallach has a new book out, Why Congress? Uh, question mark, I think. Um, Kevin Kosar, you've all been, John Fortier and others. Um, it's not going to be easy. I think the first thing we need is Congress, especially the, the newer members of Congress, um, to realize that they don't need to take all this for granted. Uh, Mike Gallagher had a great piece in the Atlantic Monthly a couple of years ago where he said, we actually need to rethink how we structure the, the sort of the, the chains of command in Congress, how much power is in the committee so far. So the first thing Congress needs is an energized generation that's willing to think differently. And we've seen that in the Senate as well, and that's a good thing. Uh, the second thing we do need to think about is the, is the procedures. And I have to admit, and this is all my friends who I just name dropped a second ago, um, they're probably not on board with this, but I think we do need to rethink the role of the filibuster in the Senate. Uh, it does a lot of good, but it also makes practical change impossible and some kind of recalibration of the uh, of the filibuster might be a good thing. When you see that so many of the consequential decisions in Congress on, on spending, on uh, Congressional Review Act author authorizations now, those things are all the things that can happen because the filibuster doesn't apply in the same way. Um, you see that, that's, that, that maybe the filibuster is blocking not just the bad stuff from happening, but also good stuff. And, and frankly, Congress doing just about anything and relearning that muscle memory. Um, Regaining that muscle memory would be a good thing too. So I'm in favor of a strong reconsideration of the of the some of those procedures in the Senate. Um, although I, I say that advisedly because you don't want to wreck the Senate and turn it into a, another sort of majoritarian body like the House. But I think those are the first two steps. Um, one last thing, I'm struck by the I'm struck by the 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 way that. Congress, remember the committees see themselves. Like I said, I just testified before a House committee. And it's funny, members of Congress seem most comfortable when they're not sort of standing in the well of the House or the Senate debating what facing one another, but when they're seated um, at the on these, these dioceses, like uh, almost like a court sitting in judgment. Because frankly, that's most of what Congress does now is sit in judgment of things that have happened rather than legislating. Um, there's something about Congress's self-perception, self-image that sees itself most comfortable sitting almost like judges rather than facing each other as legislators. And so I'm in favor of anything that puts uh, members of Congress face to face um, rather than side by side staring down their friends and enemies. I was worried you were going to suggest something crazy like breaking the filibuster rule. Uh, that's definitely. I, I was treading. I, honestly, I was. Uh, I I was treading pretty close to that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that is something that I would think. I mean, that is a, um, a action that would have en enormous consequences far far and away apart from what we're talking about today. Sure. But there is something to the idea of horse trading, right? Where uh, in order to get sixty votes in the Senate there is regulatory equilibrium on two things. One thing that is more important to one party and another thing that's more important to the other party that can achieve a 60 vote threshold. Uh, and then generally, I think outside of Congress, the idea of regulatory entity, re regulated parties fighting back. So whether it's being willing to sue an administration or being willing to have a public relations campaign, saying these uh, types of ideas are unfair to us, Congress needs to step in, uh, making sure that um, there isn't a you know a cancel culture that surrounds fighting back against an administration in Washington D.C. when it comes to a regulated entity. Those are the sorts of cultural shifts that I would love to see. Uh, you know, how, however easy they may be or difficult, um, but I think in the long run, forcing Congress's hand either by appealing to their own sense of importance or uh, making sure that agencies just can't do things under the cover of night uh, will have a longer term, longer term effect without the ramifications of breaking the filibuster. Um, one more thing I'd throw into the mix, by the way, and I, well, I'm not going to blow up anything else in the next 10 seconds. Don't yeah. worry. But um, one thing that Congress is doing that I think needs to be given more weight is it's 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 appropriations. It's sort of amazing the fact that Congress spends a lot of money. Um, which itself sort of gives direction and prioritization to the agencies, often explicitly, but sometimes implicitly. All of that has always been seen by the courts as separate from 
the interpret from 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 lawmaking. Um, I don't think that's necessarily right. I'm still thinking this through myself. Um, but I remember being on a panel once with a friend, uh, another friend on the left, an environmental law professor, who said, you know, Congress has directed the agencies through laws to do all of these things. Now Congress is obligated to fund the agencies accordingly. And I said, I think actually that's looking through the wrong end of the telescope there. That if anything, Congress's spending decisions in the here and now ought to be taken very seriously. I, I think I tried to analogize them to, um, you know, say the Clean Air Act's broad statements of principle are Congress's stated preferences, and then its spending decisions are Congress's revealed preferences. Um, but if, but you know, setting aside that that strained analogy, appropriations are law; they are legislation. And I think judges ought to have appropriations in mind. The litigants ought to bring them to bear when you're interpreting vague statutes, right? To the extent that an agency's interpretation of a law, a, 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 a vague law, an ambiguous law, strains the agency's budget, deforms the agency's mission, takes it away from its ability to do the other things that Congress has required it to do, at the very least, that ought to get a lot of scrutiny under um, the reasonableness step of Chevron step two, and under the, the sort of the arbitrary and capricious aspect of normal administrative law. Those spending decisions ought to have real substantive weight on courts' interpretive decisions um, and on their, their, their review of the agency's reasoning. Some of that can be brought to bear simply by people bringing them up in comments before the agency that the agency then has to respond to. But on an interpretive level, I do think that the judges ought to be mindful of what an interpretation means in one direction versus the other, if it has dramatic effects on the agency's capacity with its spending, to um, with its resources to tackle other issues. Congress's power of the purse is gonna be the most consequential president, uh, constitutional debate of our next 25 years. We got a flavor of the student loan case. We're gonna get more of it in the fall in the CFPB case. But I think that's just the beginning of a quarter century worth of debate of totally un under theorized and non-judicialized constitutional um, law uh, that's now going to be brought to bear in a very serious way in debates around the administrative state. You've seen some scholars um, anticipate this. Jillian Metzger of Columbia had a, had a good article. I wouldn't agree with all of it, but a good article um, on taking appropriations seriously. I think this is actually going to be the central administrative law, administrative state issue of the next two decades. And Congress is already, something Congress is already doing that we just need to bring more weight to. Because we are getting near the end of our time together, uh, Adam, I appreciated you bringing up the three points about the major questions doctrine and its discontents that Sally Katzen has made in her work elsewhere. Again, I'm sorry that she couldn't be with us today. I wondered if you and Will wanted to take a little bit more time to flesh out some areas of agreement and disagreement with her. Well, I think that the court's analysis in the West Virginia v. EPA case was very persuasive about how the major questions doctrine is not new and how it's been applied for decades um, by courts in less partisan times and how it's simply a carry forward in order to ensure that if a very broad congressional delegation of power is going to be used for something that could never have been contemplated by that Congress and wouldn't, they would never have actually given that power to the agency that it's ought, that courts ought to demand some sort of uh, unambiguous reference to that policy. In that case, it was the Clean Power Plan. Uh, and that that all makes perfect sense um, because we need to ensure the balance of the separation of powers. So uh, I think that the, the court's jurisprudence on major questions doctrine has actually been pretty good. Uh, I realize there are some ambiguities and no bright line and that it's been criticized as vibes, but I think that um, the concurrence in West Virginia versus EPA gives a few other um, factors to look for, and it's no more ambiguous than Chevron is. Yeah, now that it, the major questions doctrine has a name, it kind of seems like a new thing. It's like one of those rock bands that was around for 10 years and then they're an overnight success. Um, the, the roots of the major questions doctrine go back much further than like the last couple of cases. Um, years ago, when I was practicing with uh, with the late C. Boyd and Gray, we had a, we filed a brief in the net neutrality litigation, and it was all about the major questions doctrine. This would have been 2015. It was like uh, D.C. Circuit at Chevron step zero, you should apply the major questions doctrine. At Chevron step one, apply the major questions doctrine. And hey, guess what? At Chevron step two, apply the major questions doctrine. 
The roots of this trace back at least back to cases like MCI telecommunications, one of the great Scalia opinions, and its antecedents go back uh, even further, a century or more. Uh, and scholars like uh, Judge, then Judge Stephen Breyer, were writing, you know, along those lines in like the early debates around Chevron in the mid '80s. Um, I think the risk, though, is that um, now that it is a thing. Uh, it's going to become very popular and litigants are going to push the edges of it. And I, I don't blame them. I mean, I was an actual lawyer for a while and I practiced a lot of, you know, a lot of cases raising big issues for my clients. For every client, every question is a major question. And so it's going to be a really interesting um, sort of a series of cases in the years ahead, seeing how litigants decide whether or not to deploy that 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 doctrine um, whether circuit judges, how they decide to deal with it, and how the Supreme Court does. You know, one great case from years ago when Kavanaugh was on the D.C. Circuit, it was called um, Loving versus IRS, I think. It was a Treasury case. It had to do with um, whether Treasury could regulate tax preparers. And Kavanaugh actually uses a kind of major questions analysis in this D.C. Circuit opinion. He says, you know, tax preparers might not seem like the most earth-shaking issue of the war in, you know, in day-to-day -day American life, but it's an enormously consequential industry where, you know, millions, billions of dollars are at stake. Um, it is in some ways a, a major question. He didn't use it that term, but but it's, it's, it was the antecedent of, of that approach. And so a lot is really going to hang on how far this goes, because if every question is a major question, then it really is going to be self-defeating. And I think oh, one last thing, um, I really do think, especially conservatives, are going to have to grapple with what to do with truly ambiguous laws. Um, again, Madison was grappling with this at the start, and we're all grappling with it today. Um, a number of statutes, especially the old regulatory statutes, the public interest standards, those were all written in the most unambiguous terms. And I'm not sure what the way out of this one is, if it's a, a robust non-delegation doctrine, if it's some kind of major questions doctrine, if it's um, more rigorous procedural constraints, what it is, I don't know. Um, but, but we can't do away with with ambiguity altogether and, and sort of pinning our hopes as I often do on judges just interpreting the law the right way. Um, that's, that's asking a lot of judges when the right way is not at all self-evident. Uh, you're muted. Thank you. We are very near the end of our hour. I wondered if either of you had any concluding thoughts to share. I, I, I probably said too much already, so I'll leave it to Will. Well, I think there's a um, an ongoing question about um, what this administration is doing, what other administrations may do to uh, undo a lot of the, um, the damage going uh, going on with regard to regulated entities. Um, there's also, which we haven't even talked about, the idea of suing and settling, which is that agencies can often be sued over policies that were promulgated in the previous administration and then immediately concede. The point uh, in order to avoid having to go through notice and comment regulation. Um, we saw that uh, in one of the EPA rules on um, secret science, where the Biden administration said, "Oh, now that we now that we've lost in the in the district court, we won't even appeal." Uh, and so there are a number of ways that this uh, can go sideways. Um, but in terms of closing, I really do think that it's on. It's incumbent upon us. In our comments to executive branch agencies to talk about stable equilibriums and our amicus briefs to the court to urge them in especially constitutional questions to clarify areas so that agencies don't fill in the gaps in a way that's unconstitutional uh, and to um, not have the cancel culture mentality when an uh, entity wants to push back and sue uh, over a regulated um, a regulation that's enacted by an administration. So thank you so much to you both. I enjoyed this hour and learned a lot of new things. I hope that many of our audience members did as well. On that note, Sam, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you, Allison. Well, on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our panelists and our moderator for the benefit of their time and expertise today. Adam and Will, thank you so much for a great conversation. Allison, thank you for facilitating. And thank you also to our audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. Please check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements 
and upcoming webinars. Thank you all once more for tuning in. We are adjourned.